And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberators paradise, pasnia.com. That's P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com. Uh, the Free Republic of Pasnia is also the home of Vanu Fest, our now annual uh and this year, week-long festival of liberation. Uh, the official dates being from September 27th to October 24th. Or, uh, sorry, September 27th to October 4th. Uh, well, we don't put together a rigorous schedule. Uh, there will be a number of self-liberation opportunities available for those looking to learn, uh, courtesy of the following departments uh, here at Veritas. Uh, the Pasadena Department of Permaculture, uh, Food Self-Sufficiency. Um, we, uh, we could be processing some lambs or some birds, fall gardening and harvesting, canning, uh, maybe mushroom hunting, and uh, whatever else we, uh, we come up with. Uh, the passing Department of Defense, uh, self-defense, uh, at some point uh, during the weekend we'll do a handgun training course by uh, Pat Henry. Uh, and the passing Department of, of uh, Health and Wellness, uh, the possible experimentation uh, with various electric and magnetic healing devices uh, I uh, got to uh, test out on, uh, on a recent trip. And uh, maybe, just maybe, the acquisition of an important piece of equipment. Uh, it'll be pretty incredible. Um, and I'll certainly make an announcement uh, if, it, if it happens. But a uh, number of stakeholder dinners and um, breakfasts will be on offer for attendees in addition to books, apothecary, uh, fresh eggs, produce, and possibly meat for sale, uh, just depending on processing. But, um, of course, only vetted self-liberators are permitted entry. Uh, that is, I must know you. Uh, I must know and invite you personally, or uh, we would have to have a colleague in common uh, willing to vouch for you. If you'd like to try and get vetted, please join our Telegram chat channel, uh, the Pasnia Committee of Correspondence. Uh, that's t.me forward slash Pasnia chat. Again, t.me forward slash Pasnia chat. Um, but anyway, on to it. Uh, today, I'm pleased to welcome Lindsay Sharman, host of the Rogue Ways podcast and uh, her newest show, Middle Path, over on Rockfin. I uh, stumbled across Lindsay's podcast last year, uh, sometime when I was uh, digging up all the interview archives for some guests I'd become particularly interested in. Um, maybe Athen Comente, uh, who's a side year astrologer, or Phoenix Aurelius. Um, alchemist or spagyricist. I, I don't actually recall, but anyway, I, f I found her show and uh, subscribed and I've listened to quite a few since. Uh, in addition to, uh, I actually did a healing session with her, a uh, service she offers on her website, uh, which I will, of course, have her tell you all about momentarily. Uh, but personally speaking, I can feel um, her genuine, genuine care and compassion in every episode uh, as she strives to help individuals liberate themselves spiritually uh, and sometimes physically, uh, or maybe put more accurately, to uh, help them on their soul's journey uh, in this incarnation, whatever that happens to be. So uh, without further ado, Lindsay, welcome to uh, the Vani Podcast, uh, and thanks so much for taking some time to chat today. Uh, how are things going? Oh, they're excellent and even better after that absolutely wonderful intro. You get me. You really get me. <laughs> Good. That was Good. nice. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's good to hear. So, um, I guess, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy to make this happen, but, uh, been, uh, been looking forward to it. Um, so I guess to, to give you an idea, um, of where I'm coming from and to, to set the stage for our conversation today on spiritual liberation. Um, so I started, uh, my path started back, uh, I was, I was 18 or 19. I saw 9-11 loose change on, uh, on Netflix and, uh, didn't really act on it too much, but it was the first, first time I'd ever ex been exposed to information, um, in that realm. And it kind of, uh, blew my mind and, Six months later, I kind of started digging in a little more and uh, found Bill Cooper, um, listened to uh, basically all 2,000 hours of his uh, radio show um, when I was packing, uh, packing for a moving company for a few years. And uh, um, I, uh, I guess it was probably around 2015. I'd, I'd listened to all his, uh, all his, his uh, radio shows, and I wasn't really quite sure where to go. So I started uh, Liberty Attack Radio in February of 2015 uh, and uh, started as like a, as, as like a constitutional uh, radio show. And uh, um, soon after, found anarchism and realized it wasn't what I'd uh, been told it was, and uh, um, started reading all about uh, Austrian Austrian free market uh, Austrian economics, free market economics, um, and kind of just the philosophy of liberty. And uh, it only took a few months. I guess it only took like you know four or five months. I was like, all right, you know, the state's are evil, the state's immoral, um, and uh, obviously free markets, voluntary you know voluntary interactions between individuals. This is obviously like the better way to run society. So I was like, all right. Um, we know this, like, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? So I started um, focusing on, I guess, physical solutions to liberation back uh, towards the middle or end of 2015. And that was basically what I was doing all the way up until uh, 2019 uh, when I decided that I was going to try to uh, finally try to take, I guess, take control of my health and uh, reverse, my, uh, re reverse the uh, uh, symptoms of my so-called type 1 diabetes. And uh, I, uh, so I started looking really, really deep into health about four or five months before the, uh, before the nonsense kicked off uh, last year. Um, so it was, it was good timing. I'd already been kind of digging in, in that area. So it was, it was, was kind of good, good warm up. And, uh, 
<clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I guess uh, I mentioned Bill Cooper. I went through you know Mystery Babylon um, last year. I, I uh, that was kind of the first thing I did. I, I heard about Event Two Hundred One, and I was like, oh shit! I've been kind of not paying attention to a whole area of, uh, of it. like I just focus on solutions. But um, and I was I, I guess I wasn't quite quite prepared for anything that that, that happened last year. So um, I re-listened to, to Bill Cooper's Mystery Babylon. Kind of went back down into some of those subjects, and it led to. Um, yeah, spirituality. Um, obviously, things like uh, um, Vedic astrology, which you know, spagyrics, um, Ayurveda, and traditional Chinese medicine, and uh, that uh, I guess yeah, kind of uh, led me to kind of the spiritual liberation angle. And I realized pretty quickly when I was trying to when I was improving my health. Um, I mean, I, I, I was doing a nose to tail carnivore diet, eating really high quality food, um, and I, that obviously helped fixing defi- fi- fixing a lot of deficiencies. But I realized that it was like the spiritual and mental aspect was just as important as the physical, if not more important, if not more relevant. And uh, so, yes, it's led me to a lot of places I would have never expected to go. And um, uh, yeah, obviously found, found your, uh, your podcast uh, and your shows. Uh, really enjoyed um, the, uh, your conversation with Mitch, the Oregon donor. I've uh, placed a few orders from his website, uh, putting Oregon, I guess the Oregon cannons around, around uh, the free Republic of Pasnia here. And uh, also doing uh, some of the uh, what are they called uh, the tower busters? Um, there's uh, yeah, yeah some 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 funnel tower busters. Um, and then uh, I guess uh, another one that I I, th- I found really powerful was the clearing ancest- ancestral trauma episode with with uh, Emily, which I think pretty recently. Oh. And uh, yeah, obviously that's that's one subject I like to talk a little bit about about later on. But uh, now that I've kind of get laid out kind of where we where we are at, where we're at in this uh, in this podcast, it's more more physical liberation, trying to. Um, defend ourselves against the coercion of the state uh, and the servile society that allows the state to exist. So um, I guess uh, we also uh, we also share in common. I've heard you talk about it on your show. Um, some I guess the similarities to chronic illness and so-called disease, um, autoimmune disease specifically. That's what so-called type one diabetes is. Um, so mm-hmm. and and also it's just this you know this uh, the chronic illnesses role on our personal growth uh, and life path. So I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to you now that I've been, I've been rambling for a little while. Uh, how, how'd you get here? Uh, what, what was your path? Could you t- go, go into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. It's really, it's really weird. You know, the further I dive into it and think about it, the more I reflect that I've, I've kind of always been, I think I came here like pretty awake if we want to use that general term. And, you know, I spent my childhood years really connecting deeply with nature and with animals and, really enjoying that more than most people. (laughs) Um, And I also was very blessed that I had a mother who was exceptionally good at responding to all of my millions of questions and Mm -hmm. especially the the why phase uh, and actually answering the questions, but also being really honest when she had no idea or when what she was saying was an opinion and she knew it. And so I got to really understand that there are things that you're allowed to question and think about in that way and that I was being given the opportunity and being invited to consider what I thought, even as a small child, which I don't think a lot of adults do. And I don't know if she did it on purpose or not. I look back and I think that's just who she is. Um, I don't think she was trying to like create a certain outcome. So I'm just really lucky that she had that sort of personality that invited thought and reflection And then I also had a father who had served in Vietnam and he was drafted against his will. It was served to him as a punishment for stealing a car or something stupid Mm. and uh, forced, you know, to decide, do you want to go to jail or do you want to go to the military? And so he chose some aspect of freedom and went and, and, you know, maybe he would have ended up there either way, but he was an exceptionally good shot and he became a sniper and he was funneled into some secret programs that were not supposed to be happening. He was in Cambodia when we weren't supposed to be in Cambodia. And then they forced him to do a second term against his will or tour, I guess they call it. And so he had all kinds of shit to talk about the government <laughs> from a very early age. I heard about their lies. I heard about they for- how they forced these wars. I heard about, you know, how many lives were lost at their behest and and about these dirty programs like being in Cambodia and other things that he had experienced and seen firsthand. And so I knew from an early age also that there was something wrong going on at the deepest levels. Um, And, you know, he encouraged us not to say the flag salute. He told us it was a a cult behavior and that we didn't have to go along with a cult, (laughs) which is awesome. Um, And so I chose not to say the flag salute my entire uh, school career. And I was often the only one Uh, But no one really cared. It was cool. It was fine. Uh, But one day I came home singing, it's a grand old flag. It's a high flying flag. And he was like, what is this nonsense? 
who taught you this song? You know? And I was like, Oh, it's just a song. I was in third grade. And he was like, no, that's, that's, that's one of those songs or whatever. And so he got really angry, but um, what's cool, what's cooler than that is that he then calmed down and gave me the choice. Like, well, cause I was like, I don't even care what this song is about. I just like singing in class. Cause he's like, I don't want you singing this song. I was like, I just like singing. Like, I just want to sing with people. I don't care. This is why I, this is also why I liked to go to church. Part of it when I was young was people would sing together. And that's one of the things I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And so I chose to continue to sing that song and he gave me the option to do it. So I had these parents that were very empowering and very intelligent and very insightful. And so I grew up with this internal spirituality that was always really strong ever since I was very young and with this questioning and with this knowledge that the government could lie to you and was not to be trusted. Uh, and like that, even that practice of saying, I don't say the flag salute. I don't, I don't do that. And being allowed to do that and being respected for that from, you know, a young age on is another piece where I, I was taught early on, like you do what you want and no one gets to tell you what to do. Um, you know, and a lot of times some kids throughout the years would say something like, why are you standing up? Is this disrespect or whatever? I was like, no, you stand up because that's what you want to do. And I don't because that's what I want to do. Uh, and that was just a cool experience. So I think all of those things sort of helped form me um, as I was as I was going. And I was a very rebellious person by nature. I was a very intelligent person by nature. And so teachers hated me. <laughs> and that <laughs> propelled me to understand also how much control teachers have over students' lives. And these are some of the adults that shape us the most, unfortunately, because most of them are really mediocre to subpar humans. And a lot of them are motivated by really childish and stunted motivations, emotionally and mentally. And I saw that from an early age too. And so in considering that I would eventually have to work and make money in this in environment, I knew that I had to find a job that didn't hurt anyone because uh, that was some core value I just knew I had inside mm -hmm. of me. And I could tell that most things did hurt people in some way, whether they knew it or not. And so I had, I had to think long and hard. And I finally came up with the idea that I would become a teacher, knowing that the school system is programming and cultish, like my father had taught me, um, but also knowing that the good teachers who actually encouraged you to think critically and think for yourself and come to your own conclusions and honored you as an individual had these huge impacts on me and other uh, kids that I knew. And so, and so I wanted to be a teacher like that. And so I went about becoming a teacher I taught for 14 years and I just quit that about three years ago now. I think mm. I got out just before all of the nonsense came down the pike. Uh, so that was really nice timing on my part. Uh, good job, universe. You always got my back. Uh, <laughs> so I'm glad I did that. But it was a it was a cool experience. I did definitely, I think, present to all of my students along those 14 years this perspective of thinking critically. None of them would have ever been able to tell you if I was a Republican, Democrat, or something else, but, you know, or what any of my my personal opinions and biases were. Um, but all of them, I think, came away with at least a little bit more ability to think critically and for themselves and to feel loved and empowered in some sense. And that was really my only goal all along. So I, I think it was good while it lasted. And I'm also just desperately happy to be out of there because that system is just soul sucking and horrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, and it constantly, you know, it attacked me <laughs> over and over and over again because I did not belong. Um, and I was sneaking in the fire and nobody, want, nobody wants that fire in there. Uh, so that, that's the short of it. And then shortly after that, I started uh, Rogue Ways. And actually before that, I started it before I left teaching, but I started Rogue Ways and now Middle Path. And, you know, I've been called more and more in my life to do spiritual work. And I've been doing spiritual work on various levels for most of my life. And it's only recently, however, that I've begun to do it as a more public aspect of my life that I offer to anybody who comes along. So that's been something that's been taking the uh, front seat of direction in my life, you know, since I left teaching, which is really, really the best part of my life so far. I'm very happy I made it this this far. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's incredible. And, and you mentioned something interesting there. I mean, I, I said that uh, I, I watched, you know, 9-11 Loose Change and I was 18, 18 and 18 and a half or 19. And, uh, and well, you know, then uh, when I what I what drew me all the way in was uh, Bill Cooper's nine hour Porterville presentation back in like 1992. Here I was born, and uh, so like I was like, who the hell is this guy? So I went on this. Uh, but anyway, like so I, I was I was like you, kind of aware. Like 
I every like everything kind of hurts people. It's all it's all immoral. So I, I mentioned in early podcasts, like it kind of sucks. Like in in one way, it kind of sucked. Like um, being aware of these things so early on because it basically cut off like any any like opportunities that I saw at that time. But then on the good end of yeah. it, it forced me to. Um, like I, I've, I've been, I've been, I guess, progressively over the past three or four years trying to bring all of my actions in my life in accordance with my principles and values. And since I've started doing that, it's like, it's, it makes a, a big damn difference. It makes a big damn difference. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I thought that was, a, a, that was a, a very, very good point that you brought up is, is that you like, uh, you had to choose something and try that uh, didn't hurt somebody. So. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and that was it was that or nursing, but I was like, well, I really can't deal with people's fecal matter. So <laughs> my yeah. sister and my mom can do that for some reason, but I can't do that. Um, so I was definitely called to be a teacher. <laughs> but it is the path is narrower and narrower. The more in touch with yourself and connected you are, um, because a lot of people who are disconnected and and not thoughtful and not reflective, they don't notice any of the things that we're talking about. So it doesn't bother them to work in some of these areas and they don't consider how it might harm, you know, the environment, the earth, animals, or people. And um, when you're more aware and you think about things and you're reflective, there's not a lot in this world that's very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot that's so good, but you know, not as far as the social world goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the first realm is, is, is what I call it. I mean, Babylon's another term for it, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just that entire, it's, it's that entire institution. Um, but that's, I guess that's the other thing I'm doing is, is Pasnia here. We're trying to build, um, we're trying to build uh, an alternative, um, self-sufficient homesteads all over the U S all over the world, um, where, you know, traveling nomads or people, um, you know, pe people who have forsworn the use of coercion. Um, we can, we can have like, uh, we can have all these things. Like I've got lambs and goats here and, uh, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of the idea. Um, but, uh, yeah, the last year definitely, definitely kickstarted that, but I guess the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention, I'll mention this too. Um, another, another, uh, venture I co-run is Liberty Tech Publications, a Liberty and Sol uh, Solutions oriented publishing outfit, uh, much in the vein of what, what I, what I've been talking about, but, uh, you're also an author too. Um, could you tell us a, a bit about your books yeah. and, uh, maybe, uh, maybe we could talk privately about offering a Rogueways bundle uh, to our audience or something. It'd be pretty sweet, I think. Oh yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah, I've been writing my whole life also. I've been reading since I was very young. I started reading before my older sibling. <laughs> and I uh, I just laughed because I didn't mean to like show her up. I was just very interested in language uh, from an early age. And I have a, you know, decent IQ and ability to learn. And so I was reading really high level books at a very early when I was in when I was six or seven, I was reading college level text and I do clearly remember not understanding a lot of it <laughs> and I would ask my mom something she'd be like that's not you're not no we're not talking about that <laughs> so I'm sure there was stuff in there I shouldn't have been reading anyway uh, but I just needed more and more and the library would run out of things and so I think that set the stage for me becoming a writer without me ever having even considered it um, but it was really cool when I was in fourth grade, I think it was, uh, we got some of our first computers at school. I mean, we had computers before then and we would type sometimes, but that was the extent of it. They were basically glorified typewriters. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fourth or fifth grade, we started doing more things with it. And um, But I still wanted to keep typing. And so when we were in computer class, which is what they called it, um, we were given the opportunity and I wrote a story and I just found it in my mom's house when I went to visit last week. And it's hilarious. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. But it's better writing I'm not exaggerating. It's better writing than most of my high school students could have ever created. Like it has perfect punctuation, even in fourth grade mm -hmm. and like complex sentence structures and, and all of multi-layered plot. It was just really, <laughs> but it was very funny because it's also a child's mind, like writing these things. Like I know at one point a hypodermic needle was used in a nefarious way. <laughs> um, but anyways, I was writing from a really young age and I actually, you know, would I really give a lot more credit than that to is as, as foundational as that all was, uh, I went through um, great trauma and my father died when I was 11. And so they had me do some counseling in school. And one of my counselors uh, suggested, since I wouldn't talk a lot, I wouldn't share a lot of my emotions, she suggested that I start journaling. And I was like, I don't really understand what that is. And she's like, oh, you just sit down and write on the paper as though you're talking to someone, but knowing that no one ever has to read it. If you want someone to, they can. And if no one, you know, if you don't want anything, to, then no one ever has to read it. I was like, what, what? This is amazing. Like, what a concept. And so I would just like fill pages and pages and pages. And I would write for hours a day because I was finally unleashed to just be free and say whatever I wanted. That I think is even better training 
uh, than some of that early reading and early writing that I did because it really taught me to get into flow states, which I wouldn't have even known what that meant. It taught me to let my emotion come out into my words. It taught me to have no filter. Um, and all of these things, which I really credit you know, later on with some of the writing that I've done, which I now look at as having been channeled, which at the time I, I just hated that word so much. And I, <laughs> I think there's so many fake people out there who use words like this that I just like hate even being associated with it. So I had a lot of resistance to it, but mm -hmm. I've eventually come to understand that that's just what it is and I have no better word. So I just have to get over myself and say that word and say that that's what it was. But I think that's, that's why, you know, as I've actually was practicing channeling in a sense from an early age. And, um, and so my books have appeared, they've been birthed through me from wherever they come from, whatever you want to call that state, the ideal is what some call it, and into this world. And now they exist. And it's weird because I have them. I sell them. I love them. I've read them many times myself uh, because I don't really feel like they're mine. But my name is on them, uh, <laughs> my pen name at least. Uh, and I do have a memoir that isn't really channeled at all. It's just one of my first uh, things that I put together and created a book out of. Uh, and I have some poetry books, which, um, you know, individual poems may or may not have been channeled, uh, but the book itself isn't really. But my first novel, Sign Curve of Eons, is definitely one that came from elsewhere and was channeled through me. And uh, it's a great treatise on the past and the many ways the past could have gone, especially those that we don't uh, accept or we're not supposed to accept, an alternative history sort of. But it's got a bit of sci-fi, bit of magic, bit of love, bit of romance, bit of all of that mixed in with it too. And it's just a beautiful and chilling tale of the great evil that exists in the world or the human soul or however people look at that and what humans are doing over the eons and the yuga cycles with that great evil as a um, adversary. And then the sequel to that appeared and came out and it's called Earth, A Trough in Time and it takes place in our modern day. And so you can read these in any order. Uh, and the third is coming, it is happening oh, yeah. and who knows when it will be done. <laughs> so it's a trilogy and it's not yet finished. Okay, very nice, very nice. Well, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I will have to go pick up some books. I was uh, looking at your store a couple weeks ago and I was gonna, I was gonna look at, uh, I was gonna place an order. So I think I might uh, go back there and and uh, and check those out because that uh, yeah, sound uh, sound fascinating. We offer uh, at uh, libertarianattack.com. I found fiction to be a really 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 powerful way to convey the message of freedom and also like uh, the the solutions that we offer aren't always just easily understandable to people. So if you put them in a fiction book, you can people can un understand and see them in action. So we uh, we actually have I call it it's anarchist fiction. Um, there's one uh, hashtag Agora which is based on uh, real cypherpunk crypto anarchists uh, over in uh, Berlin Germany. And uh, we've got a couple of clients that we publish books for. Um, Brush Fire is uh, kind of uh, kind of similar in the same vein, but uh, that's 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 uh, really really fascinating. Uh, we'll have to uh, definitely have to check those out. Thank you. Yeah, they're definitely really life changing and super fun to write. And I feel blessed that they chose me. Mm -hmm. I heard uh, an author once talk about you know, that there really is this realm of the ideal that Plato talked about. And that, you know, if, if inspiration comes to you, it's one of those ideas trying to be born and you're, and it chose you, you know, like that idea popped into your mind, not out of nowhere, but out of this place, because it wanted you to notice it and it wants you to birth it. And so I, and at the time that I first heard that concept, I was like, man, some people are crazy. Like <laughs> this person's insane. And then it happened to me and I'm like, man, I'm so blessed. I was literally sitting there in bed one night and I was like, it'd be kind of fun to read a book about these things that I always think about. And then someone said, you should write it. And I was like, huh. And then it just pff, popped into my head, all three books, like at once. And I had to like madly scribble down as much as I could. because I was like, I know I'm going to forget this. Uh, mm -hmm. But I didn't because, you know, I gave it enough attention that it has stuck around with me, which is nice. Um, but I, it's an interesting concept, and I, and in that way, I do feel very blessed that I feel like I was uh, chosen for this specific <laughs> idea to come into being. And I don't think it's that unique. I mean, nothing's new under the sun, right? There's aspects of it that are all around us and in all sorts of other books, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, but, you know, the, this story has only been told once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Oh, very awesome, very awesome. So, um, I guess, uh, um, I, uh, so yeah, to, to to jump forward just a little bit, but 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 not really. I, I mentioned uh, in, earlier in the introduction that I learned very early on in, in my attempts to reverse the symptoms of my so-called type one diabetes that the mental and the spiritual realms are even mis even more important than physical so-called cures uh, in the three D realm. Um, and the first one, this is something I I, I didn't, but uh, breathing and breathing correctly. Um, that was one thing I, I mentioned. It was last uh, thanks, uh, Thanksgiving here at Pasadena. I had some people over, had some friends, and uh, it was like, uh, you know, I'd, I've been breathing wrong for 27 years. Uh, so I learned mm -hmm. that from Dr. Perlando. Um, thank you, Bear. Um, and uh, so that was that was major. I, I noticed because uh, when you breathe, you can calm yourself down. You can, you can breathe yourself out of any situation. I found. Um, and then the second one was, and, and I would have thought this was just ridiculous a few years ago, but putting myself, I guess, putting myself on the grateful or thankful, um, I guess, frequency. Because um, if you think about it in terms of like homeopathics, like like attracts like. Um, so if you're on that mm -hmm. grateful and thankful, um, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's interesting. So um, I guess the, the question for you to start this conversation on spiritual liberation is, um, what has been the most impactful for you? Um, and freeing your, freeing your mind from the status programming, uh, intergenerational traumas, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Whew, that's a, a hard question. question to answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, it's funny cause people will say like, oh, didn't you have this experience? And I'm like, yeah, but which one? Uh, cause I've had many shamanic encounters and healings. I've had many, what people call and what I sometimes call demonic attacks, I've had many spiritual awakenings, if you want to call them that. I've had many interactions with entities and intelligences, um, which at first I was sure was just me going insane. And over many, many years, as I've learned how to interact with them and understand them and, and sometimes even work together with them. And, um, and, and all of this has contributed, right? But like, was there one that was more important than others? I don't know. I, I always kind of fall back on uh, my first... Uh, demonic encounter because it definitely secured the knowing for sure without a doubt that there were other things going on in this world that were spiritual and not mental and not emotional and not physical uh, and that they were independent from my own consciousness and uh, you know kind of parallel to reality and so I couldn't doubt that anymore and you know I doubt the nature of it I doubt what you want what we want to call it it doesn't even really matter to me anymore um, but those types of things are all I'm, I'm able to consider, you know, various different flavors of it. But but does it exist? Like, absolutely. Like, that's not a doubt in my mind. And then at the same time, it secured my uh, faith because I learned that there is never a time where you are unsafe without protection or without help and allies. And so that is such a powerful part of what I do. You know, a lot of what I do, people are like, how do you? how do you handle this? Like, how do you handle seeing like the depths of just the most insane darkness in people's souls and in whatever realm you want to call that parallel space? Uh, and I'm like, well, I, cause I know I'm fine. Like I, I have no doubt. I have the most unshakable, strongest faith because I've been face to face with the darkest and dankest of horrors and uh, come out the other side completely unscathed. So that that's a gift you know those things were not fun to deal with and they never have been since and at the same time it's a deep gift to be able to know for sure uh that 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 can't hurt you because i think the common person otherwise especially because we are so encouraged to detach from our spirituality from nature from ourselves and to go into um, complete illusion and delusion and distraction uh, and most people, when they're faced with something like that, would either go insane or um, just go straight into fear and not be able to come back out. But if they knew what I know, then they wouldn't, you know? And so it is a gift in many ways. And I guess maybe that's a good answer to start with. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. So I, I mentioned earlier that I did a, a healing session with you. Uh, and I guess uh, um, you kind of... Um uh, not, I wouldn't say like it wouldn't necessarily meet up with evil entities from uh, evil entities or ever, but but there was uh, there was something called a soul retrieval um, that she did, and it was actually really good timing mm -hmm. because it was probably two weeks before that. I just I'd listened to that episode that she did on soul retrieval, so um, I wasn't oh, wow. I didn't I didn't know that that was uh, I didn't I didn't really know anything about it before then. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll make <laughs> sure to post a link to that episode of uh, Rogue Ways. But could you tell us a bit about uh, soul retrievals and and kind of. Uh, um, and, and yeah, that'd be a good time to talk about, uh, I guess, the, the healing and the, the healing sessions and some of the services you offer on your website, too. 
Yeah, I, I do uh, what I call healing ceremonies. And, you know, in these, I essentially a huge piece of this work I do is that I've um, offered myself in a way to whatever you might call God. <laughs> if there's demons and, and evil, whatever the opposite of that is. And really, it's just nature. It's the all pervasive field, right? It's the singularity. It's the source. It's whatever you, whatever, whatever words you need. I don't really care. Uh, but what I just call it, what's good, true, and beautiful, because it's easier to describe it than it is to give it a label, right? Um, and I've offered myself to that, and I would just say, whatever you, whatever you need me to do, like you, let me know. And this is how all most of my life has come about. And so <laughs> this is what I follow. I follow synchronicity, and I follow uh, guidance from that source and that level of being. And so in doing that, I was guided to offer these healing ceremonies and I call it healing ceremony for a reason. It's a little bit nebulous because each person who comes to me has a completely different, uh, you know, soul makeup or a place that they're at in their life or their level of consciousness and, and what they need is different and what they can handle is different. Um, and so I don't say to people, this is going to be a soul retrieval. And I don't say to people, we are going to learn about your past lives. And I don't say to people, we for sure are going to know some of your guides. But most of the time, a combination of those things happens. Um, and I just don't make promises because when I be, until I go into that ceremonial space on behalf of someone who has asked me to do so for them, I have no idea what's going to happen or how it's going to happen. Um, I just know that I'm going to do it. So... Uh, so you, I mean, I think everyone who gets this level of healing is profound, it's transformative, there's always release, uh, and there's always upliftment. And so no matter what, it's good. Uh, but some people have what we call a soul retrieval, and that's um, when basically there's a piece of us that we have abandoned or cut off or rejected, and our soul, our consciousness can't live without wholeness without connection. And really, it's still connected. It's just that we live in this delusion and this lie that it's not. And that creates uh, disharmony. And it creates uh, negativity. And a lot of times, it also creates what we call attachment or demonic or negative entity interference because they found this sort of hole in you with which to come through or with which to take up residence or however you want to think of these things. Uh, and so a lot of times that happens too. And so... In this ceremonial space, uh, my first step is actually to remove, and, and I say I, but it's not me. I'm just um, there holding space and witnessing and inviting allies in, and just as, as you or whoever is receiving this has invited me in. Uh, but we go in, I should say, and clear out any negative attachments or entities first and kick them out so that we have this clear space with, with which to work with just your consciousness and your soul and your soul's needs and histories. Uh, and then we just see what happens. I just ask if if nothing just pops up, which sometimes like people's souls are like rearing to go and they're like, okay, here we go. Like, this is what we're going to deal with. It's like, word, uh, we'll just go and do that. But um, if not, I'll invite your allies that are good, true and beautiful forward so that we can meet them and see if any of them have a specific message or a specific gift to share or something like that. And that happens sometimes. And then I'll ask if there's anything we can heal um, or bring light to or bring upliftment to. And that's generally when we find, uh, you know, the broken spot or the empty spot or the place in which your soul was detached or abandoned or forgotten. And oftentimes it involves a past life as well. A lot of times the part of ourselves that we have cut off happened in another life and this trauma is old. And so we go diving. And so sometimes I see the story of a past life and I can see this soul, you know, your soul, for example, in another role as another person in another time. And I can see just the highlights of what the trauma was sort of like a, almost like a flip book um, sometimes. And in that, I can usually then understand very easily what happened and why the rejection was made and why the abandonment happened. Uh, and then a lot of times the allies of this person will take us down. It's often in a deep, dark place. It's different for each person because it's really your psyche that has created this space. Uh, and we go digging and diving and eventually we find something and it looks different for everyone. It's always different for everybody. It's very interesting. Uh, and we uh, can generally bring that piece back. It's like a piece of consciousness. It's like if, it's like if you suddenly had a memory restored 
Um, but for a lot of people, it is still not conscious even after it comes back. And for some people, it is. They're like, oh, my God, I remember this entire thing that I had forgotten from my childhood, like as soon as we finished, uh, which isn't surprising. But it is also not surprising that a lot of times it's happening on such a deep level or a soul level that the person doesn't have a conscious recall. Um, but on the spiritual level, the way I see it, that piece then is brought back by either myself or the allies that are carrying it. I'm brought to the person and the person is invited to reintegrate it. And then that looks various ways for various people as well. But it's always really beautiful. It's like a reunion. It's like a long lost friend that, you know, you'd forgotten that you had and you finally get to connect again. And it's really, I often am brought to tears. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that happens pretty frequently with most people who get a ceremonial healing from me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I, I can uh, I can definitely say that I I I uh, definitely valued mine a lot. Um, it's uh, it helped makes it helped make sense of a lot uh, of a lot of things that I've done in my life that I really wasn't sure where that where that passion came from or where you know what's uh, what the reasoning was behind it. Um, and then there are also some interesting, yeah. And there are also just some 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 I guess some details, um, the some details that you brought up that you wouldn't have known those before, but like they were just like. I like that just stuff from my childhood that um, that like very important um, things that like I, I really hadn't talked about with anybody. So um, that's that was like oh, that, that's, that's awesome. fascinating, too. And then like it's 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 been it's been fascinating going going into this realm because I did a, a Vedic astrology reading um, last uh, was it last Friday. And uh, um, again, like uh, uh, it was uh, just it helped make sense of a lot of things. And and this guy, Brian Easterday, I'll, I'll go I'll, I'll give him a shout to plug. Cause it was yeah very valuable. Um, but uh, yeah, he didn't know me. He knew I did publishing, but that's ba that's basically it. Um, that was thank us because of my email signature. So like he didn't know who I was, but like he walked through and like basically ex explained my personality to a T. And uh, I guess uh, talked about how I could more how I could better balance out and use my uh use my i guess my skills or my, my i guess my tendencies um to to my advantage in balancing out masculine and feminine and, and those sorts of things so it was really uh really incredible really valuable and uh yeah i wouldn't have looked into any of the any of these things before but um but yeah it's uh it's 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 all really 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 valuable stuff um i guess do you uh i've, I've i guess i've heard you talk about it a little bit on some podcasts but uh, do you have any experience with astrology and any anything in that realm yeah, I, I mean, I have my own experiences with I, I cast and, and interpreted and read my own chart when I was on a lot of speed when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> um, I stayed up all night just like voraciously like cast like casting and doing my own chart. So I had a start, you know, but I, um, I don't have as much of a mind for details as a lot of people do. So I don't do any interpretation for people or anything. And a lot of people will be like, yeah, you know, Jupiter in my fifth house. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> like, I can't memorize just like lists of signs and what the houses mean. And, and it's not my my wheelhouse, really. Mm -hmm. um, but I have learned over and over again just how powerful astrology is in our life. And, you know, what do they say? Millionaires don't practice astrology, but billionaires do. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason there's a reason why the controlling factions in our world uh, have used this these arts. There's a reason why they've been around for thousands of years. Uh, and there's a reason why you can look at them and really see these details that are not true for everyone. You know, there's a lot of people who are like, yeah, you can read any horoscope in the paper and it can apply to you. And you're like, well, that's because the paper is written for like a third grade reading <laughs> level or something. Like it's going to apply to anyone because it has to be general and it's like three sentences or less. Um, but if you look into actual astrology, it can't apply to anyone. I've read other people's charts. They have nothing to do with me at all. You know, and then I've read my own and been like, well, that's exactly me to a T. So <laughs> mm -hmm. clearly there's something to this, uh, in my opinion. But... Yeah. Um, I do, I play with astrology as much as it's in my tarot readings on my cards. There's a lot of, uh, astrological, astrological influence, but other than that, I don't, I don't cast or read charts, but I love the topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, um, I was, I, I guess, like I said, this all started with trying to reverse my type one diabetes. So like that took me to Ayurveda, yeah. which took me to Vedic astrology, which is medical astrology. I've got the first book in a series. Um, that I'm going to read on medical astrology. Um, so like this all, like it all, it's, it's crazy how it's all kind of, I guess it all, it all connects, um, even though it's kind of disparate, well, but yeah, go ahead. Isn't it, isn't it interesting too, that, you know, like I was saying about this demonic attack that I suffered when I was young and that led me really more deeply into all of this understanding and faith and all of these things. Um, 
you know, is this, it's not the same, but it is similar to having something like type one diabetes, right? It's an adversary, uh, which is really all that Satan ever meant in the, in the Bible too. Uh, and in other faiths as well, there's similar ideas. And so facing these uh, adversarial conditions in our life, or however you want to describe that, is really what brings us to the deepest understanding of ourself and this reality and our power in it. And it's actually very empowering. And, you know, we can look at the hero's journey and see this in literature uh, for, for book nerds like us. Over and over and over again, we see the exact same path, right? The person comes out, they're just fine. All of a sudden they face some sort of adversary. It's hard. They want to fail or feel like they should give up or whatever. They face it anyway. They slay the demon. They come out the other side. Now they have these new gifts, these new abilities, these new tools, these new skills, whatever it is to bring back and then offer to other people. And this is really all any of us is doing here, <laughs> is this exact process, right? Finding bigger and bigger demons and adversaries with which uh, to hone our skills and development against. So in a way, as much as I did a show on this too, I think it's called The Purpose of Darkness. Mm -hmm. In a way, we can be grateful even for these incredibly difficult times and hardships which we face in life. Yeah, yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. And I guess as of late, the like to the, the personal... Um... I guess revelation I've had looking into health is that pain is your, just your body talking to you. So like I I lived my entire life like trying to avoid and fearing pain and like um, and, and that sort of thing. But uh, now it's like I'm thankful for it because it's telling me that like there's a deficiency you have to supply. So then I supply it and the pain stops. It's crazy how that works. Right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, I, I guess, uh, and, and uh, I wanted to bring up in, in terms, in regards to the, the soul retrieval and the, uh, and the, uh, I guess in the Ayurvedic realm, just as a point for the audience here, for, for the listeners here. But, uh, so according to Ayurveda, um, I guess, uh, it's, this is a paper, Ayurvedic management, of diabetes mellitus. Um, but according to Ayurveda, Pramaha, Pramaha, uh, Pramaha, they don't just call it type one or type two diabetes. There's four major types and in total 21 types. Um, and uh, the fourth oh. type is juvenile diabetes for children, which is what I, I was diagnosed at 15, um, for unhealthy practices of parents and or due to the sins of, of, uh, of past births. So, like, oh. this, it's all, like, uh, and, and, and a lot of people would think, and I would have thought that was kind of ridiculous four years ago or whatever, but, um, like, they've been, they, yeah. they had solutions, they had non-pharma solutions to, um, to manage um, the so-called condition of diabetes back like 4,000, 5,000 years ago. Like this is not new. This is not new yeah. um, to any of them. Um, and uh, then you get into, the, into, I guess, into Germany and there's cell salt clinics who just who primarily focus on, on cell salts. Um, tissue salts and then German new mm. medicine and like there's there's just there's so much there's so much else that's out there um, but uh, but anyway I guess not to not to I guess divert too much um, but uh, yeah I guess uh, I, I, well, I'll this turn is... it over to you I, I don't I, I don't know where I was going with that <laughs> well it's interesting because this is why you know I first encountered my own past life memories I shouldn't say this is why, but this is what I got out of these random recalls that I would have in, in meditations or in, in sort of visions, um, is that I would see these past lives. I would experience them as though I lived was living them again. I would remember my entire life there and up to that moment, and then I would experience this incredibly horrifying trauma. And I say to people, I think a lot of people are like, I want to recall my past lives. And I'm like, Ugh. it was really honestly, some of the worst moments of my life were remembering my past lives, <laughs> like genuinely the worst things that have happened to me. So I learned in each of those though, because each time it would happen, I'd be like, oh, that's why I do this thing. Kind of like you were saying with the um, healing that I gave for you, you kind of understood more about your behaviors or why you were attracted to certain things or, or other things. It was the same with me. I was like, that's why I hate it when people touch my neck. This is why I react when people do that. This is why I've been angry my whole life about these things. Like all of these things made so much more sense when I had these recalls and these memories resurface. And then when I brought healing to that and acceptance of that and love to that self-love and really uplifted those things out of this traumatic cycle that they had been stuck in in my psyche, just so much would transform. People would, you know, say to me like, wow, you really like lightened up or you've really like become a different person. And it's like, well, I've become more of myself uh, because I've retrieved this piece of me that was lost in trauma. And it really, and my body has healed more as I've gone, you know, my mind has become more clear the more further I've gone. And it's just, we can't underestimate this and we do we're taught to this whole society is based on ignoring the soul and ignoring our connection to nature which is soul 
uh, you know, whatever. I, I hate that we have all these words and that right. people are so attached to them because it really is all the same thing. But when we ignore that, we really ignore this entire capacity we have to heal ourselves, to transform our behaviors. And, you know, there's people out there, I'm sure everyone can relate to be like, why do I keep doing this? You know, like, why can't I just stop? I don't want to do this anymore, whether it's like smoking or for me, it was like dating just the biggest assholes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, I really, I don't want to date assholes. I can't stop. I don't understand this. Um, a lot of times these are the answers, you know, is your physical health, for sure, your mental health, for sure, your emotional health, for sure. But your spiritual health undergirds all of those things. It's really the boss of all of those things, right? It's from which we have come and to which we return. And it animates literally everything. So if we're ignoring that, we're ignoring so much, especially in our potential for growth and healing on every level, you know, physical included, like you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it brings to mind, uh, um, I came across something recently, or I guess a, a revelation that's not new to me. Uh, again, nothing original to me, but um, just that, uh, um, and just, uh, so like the, the Servile Society, as I call it, um, like from birth, like its its main objective is to crush the authentic self. And looking at that from, I guess, a medical perspective, I guess just a medical or um, disease um, etiology um, perspective, um, it, that 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 impact on the nervous system is really 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 damaging and if uh, the, mm -hmm. if you're if you're constantly um, and you know fight or flight mode you're you're not you know healing you're not uh, you're not you're not uh, you know regenerating as you could and uh, that you, you combine that with uh, you know the chronic poisons in society um, and uh, just uh, um, you know the 60 60 uh, 60 vaccines up you know up until uh, you know age six like all of these things, um, they just, they, they crush, you know, from like trauma, from a trauma based mind control level, just like crush the authentic self and that alone, like even just without all that, even just that one thing of crushing the authentic self, like if, if it's, if, if the child had a perfect health, perfect life, uh, you know, health wise, um, and physically, um, if, uh, they couldn't uh, do what they wanted, um, or express themselves, um, you know, growing up that, that can be just the sole cause of, of uh, so-called disease. So yeah, it's, it's critically, critically important at every level. Um, and it's, uh. And, and so, yeah, you, you mentioned that we're so d disconnected spiritually from nature and, and, and our, and our, I guess, our souls. Well, like, look at how things are. Like, everyone's sick. I don't think that's any, um, any coincidence. Yeah, no, it's not. And it's by design and it's intentional. And it's really sick to be a teacher and watch it happening, you know. And this is part of, again, why I left eventually is I could do my best for individual students and I can give them a lot of opportunities to see what they otherwise not be seeing or be allowed to see and I can love the crap out of them and give them that experience of an adult loving them genuinely and all of these things but I could not stop the fact that this system was built to detach them from themselves and to become a, a you know obeying mind controlled fool and it's sad it gets to you you know there's secondary trauma in that that and and tertiary trauma and that that is really impossible to get away from even for the the strongest amongst us um and like you describe it destroys you and it's on purpose if the if the vaccines didn't get you if the shit that they put into the food the air and the water didn't get you then the system itself is going to get you and so rare and so beautiful to see some of the parents i know who are homeschooling who have never vaccinated their kids who give their kids organic food and clean water and just the brilliance of these souls and these minds. And you know, people are constantly like, well, how are they gonna make sure they know da da da? I'm like, dude, I don't care at all about math. I do, I just like, I don't care if one individual does or does not love math or doesn't ever learn the quadratic equation. Like it's not gonna, you know, blindside, like I don't care, but mm -hmm. look at their eyes. Look at how bright they are. Look at how they create all day long. Look at how they still have a genuine love of learning even when they're like 17, that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> Um, there's just, I have so many examples of these kids who are just so brilliant. They're beyond what the public school system could ever produce because the public school system does not honor individuality or creativity. And it intentionally destroys the mind and the ability of the mind to make connections between vast areas of thought and philosophy. And it's just so sad, but it's so beautiful to see the opposite. So beautiful. And I've been blessed to see so many examples and I'm just really grateful for the people who are living like it sounds like you are creating and inspiring others to do the same and you know helping create children like this because i do see that as the only way out of the mess we're in you know we can't expect to fight directly such a system and you know all of our best thinkers from 
back into the distant, distant past, right up until like Bucky, Fuller, and others have pointed out the futility in direct conflict and fight with a system, but the success rate of creating your own systems in a parallel way in order to make the other systems completely pointless. Uh, and that, that that's just, that's, <laughs> there, nothing could stop that. I mean, they can bomb the shit out of you, you know, like mm -hmm. they did to Waco and other places. <laughs> but, that, <laughs> but yes, they really it's a couldn't decentralized if network. Was doing it. Yeah, if it's a decentralized network, then yeah, they, that's that. There's yeah, it's one is uh, you know, one is is not uh, significant. It's not critical. So right. Um. Yeah. Exactly. It's uh, <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. That's uh. That's 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 definitely true. That's definitely true. Um. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, there the the other thing I wanted to kind of mention we we've been kind of talking a little bit about it with uh, um like uh um with this with this society um it it only it only takes one tie and I, I guess it took me um I kind of called my I called myself a sheep until last year because um like there was still I didn't think like the entire like there was like one or two okay parts of like Babylon but everything else was what was bad um so like I I've, I I kind of made the realization last year that like it it only takes one tie. Only it takes one tie um, to to that society, but thankfully, um, you know, as we were we're, we're kind of talking about, uh, um, it's uh, the the societies are diverging whether people like it or not, and uh, um, you know we can yeah. we can you know that that's that that society is going to be what it's going to be, um, but we can you know create the second realm is is what we call it create the second realm um, where it's based on uh, you know voluntary interaction um, and non coercion so. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's what we're, uh, we're, we're doing here and, uh, um, got a lot of people. We just cleared, we've got a, we cleared just a hundred people in the, uh, committee of correspondence chat. So like it's, uh, it's, it's growing, it's growing. And, uh, yeah, I mentioned, uh, Vonifest earlier and, uh, Lindsay, I, I talked, I've since you sent it to you in the email, it'd be awesome. I don't think you're too far away. It'd be awesome if you could, uh, you could come out. Um, trying, I'm trying to get, we're working slow up. Like I said in the beginning, like everyone's got to be vetted and I'm just kind of slowly as I come across people, I really appreciate on, uh, you know, on, uh, on podcasting and, and such. I, uh, I'm sending out invites, uh, invites like that. So it'd be great to have you. I'd, I'd love to, um, you know, eventually get, uh, you know, like Dr. Bear Lando and, um, uh, like Phoenix Aurelius, Athen Comment. I don't know if Athen does these sorts of things, but it'd be awesome to get to, to get like a, to get get uh, you know get get folks uh, get get folks together um, for sure. Yeah, I love that vision and I love what you're doing. And um, I don't think I'd be able to make it this year, but I I would love to someday be able to come and and experience that. And you're smart to vet people and select people because um, just in my short amount of time working with organizing, community organizing, and protests and what not back in the day um there are agents everywhere <laughs> even in the smallest um organization even in the yeah. smallest and especially in the more fringe organizations there are agents everywhere so it's smart I, even if you vet people maybe that could still happen but like you said if there's enough decentralization and enough empowerment of people especially in that anarchist tradition of not having um rulers but you mm -hmm. know leadership is still nice <laughs> and encouraging leadership and everyone uh then it can't be stopped anyway. And they know it. And that's why they fear us connecting and uplifting ourselves and healing ourselves and empowering ourselves and all of the things with, that they try to stop. Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. So um, yeah, I guess we've, we've been talking for, for about uh, 53 minutes here. I guess the last thing I'll mention or I'll, I'll bring up is um, we talked a little bit, like uh, I guess uh, um, you did a, an episode on it recently, but so like autoimmune disease. Um, and uh, I guess to, to conclude, we can, uh, I, I'll mention like, uh, I guess I've realized, or I guess come to really appreciate the divine intelligence of the body, like everything that it did, it did to protect me. It didn't do it to, um, to hurt me. So, um, and I recently, I guess, made a rev revelation. Uh, Sophia Smallstorm was on, I guess, a higher side chats. And um, she uh, was, she was talking about glyphosate. Um, and uh, that's uh, like if uh, glycine being a non-coding, uh, or I guess uh, glyphosate being a non-coding glycine analog, if that gets in place, um, mm -hmm. the body doesn't attack itself. It's trying to correct um, correct it. And then there's going to be symptoms. The symptoms are going to be masked by antibiotics or whatever. And it's just, it's going to be, um, it's gonna, there's, there's going to be a, um, yeah, there's not going to be a healing stage. Um, but uh, that was, I guess, one, yeah. one interpretation. And she, that was relevant to the, to the, to the, type 1 diabetes just just but um i guess uh what what have you come or i guess what what's your take on on autoimmune disease as as, as uh i guess the pharma would call yeah. it yeah 
it's really it's really flourishing lately it's really hit mm-hmm. me lately for various reasons but i like you know i've always had this again i've just realized more and more a lot of my core uh, morals ethics and principles were just instilled before i came here and i've stuck to them my whole life because even when i would have a fever somebody would offer me like a tylenol or whatever and i'd be like no thanks i mean why wouldn't i want my fever my fever is here to help me <laughs> you know like i knew that and my mom would be so frustrated with me because she's a nurse and she wants to give medicine for symptoms and mask the symptoms and i'd be like no we're like supposed to barf when we're sick and have fever when we're like these are the things that are making you better i don't want to stop them but in autoimmune, I had the opposite idea because I was given it and it just didn't, it didn't hit me for so many years that these things that were happening to me were not my body just being poorly programmed and ridiculous and attacking itself. This is what we're told is that your body is messed up and it doesn't understand and it's making this mistake and nothing can fix the mistake that it's making. Your body's internal wisdom is broken and it's going to be that way for your whole life. It's going to attack you. It's going to attack you for various reasons and you're never going to be able to stop it. It's this very hopeless series of lies And like I said on the episode I did recently about it, I don't think that people propagating this lie generally are doing it out of malice. I don't think they understand. I think they genuinely believe it. I think at some point at the core of it, it was a known lie. But I think the way we've trained people to be idiots, uh, they can't know better. (laughs) And so they genuinely think they're helping you by helping you mask your um, immune flare-ups instead of getting to the root of it. And it makes so much sense to me to have learned that all of these various immune flare-ups I've had over my life were all one thing. I don't know how I didn't notice it. I'm a very perceptive person, but I just didn't. It was just the thing that got through, you know, that I just didn't understand. And I was very lucky to, again, here's that thing where this negative experience and this adversary we faced was actually a good thing. But I had the most horrible flare-up of my life. All of my bones were aching and, and pulsing. Like my whole skeleton was just in desperate pain. I had headaches, I had migraines, I was crying, I was angry, I had no energy, I couldn't get up and do anything. It was just, I was a wreck. My skin, I had like welts and rashes and all this stuff that I don't even know if I'm listing at all. It was really Mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. And it lasted for maybe three days or something. And finally, someone sent me some screenshots of a book about autoimmunity and especially Hashimoto's, which I've been diagnosed with. And this book told me my life story from the moment I got scarlet fever when I think I was seven or nine years old. Scarlet fever, really bad. And then shortly after that, I started having rashes. And that's when I was told that they were autoimmune. And then some years later, I had a really stressful event occur and I uh, was traumatized by it. And then I had this, what they called rheumatoid arthritis, likely, even though they said they couldn't prove it. I wouldn't know until the next flare up, but they told me it was probably that. It sounded like that. And I also couldn't move for three days during that one. That was a long time ago. Um, And then for a while after that, I was somewhat okay and still had some of my rashes and other autoimmune stuff. But then I went through another very, very stressful period of time. And I developed what they then called Hashimoto's. And I was told that this is basically a life sentence and that I would slowly get worse and worse until I died. (laughs) And I uh, have gone to many doctors since then. That was about five or six years ago. And I've asked them, you know, can I do nutrition and do these things and do those things? And like, you can, it might help, but basically it's just going to get worse until you die. And I just kept getting angrier and angrier. And then I had this really bad flare up and this person sent me those things. And this book told me that entire story as though I had told it to them. Mm -hmm. So I was like, how do they know? How do they know I got scarlet fever? How does he know that I've had all these flare ups? How does he know that they were at the most stressful times of my life? How does he know all these things? And he's saying it's not autoimmune and that it's this virus, this Epstein-Barr's virus. And a lot of people don't believe in viruses anymore and that's fine. It doesn't actually matter to me what we call it, just like it doesn't matter to me what we call demons or entities. Um, But that whatever the thing is, whatever the mechanism is causing this, it is a mechanism and it is not my body attacking itself. And that's why these people can trace it all throughout my life and tell me about it. And the point of all of it is this desperate relief I had when I realized the truth of this in my body, that my body, like you said, was never attacking me. It was never attacking me. It was trying its damnedest and its hardest to rid me of this mechanism and to cleanse my body of this invader, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. and to give me any semblance of health and to keep it from going ever deeper. And it kept going ever deeper and my body couldn't fight it off because I wasn't armed with the knowledge of what nutritional support to give my body in order for it to have a fighting chance. And instead I was giving it almost exactly the opposite of what it needed for decades. So (laughs) 
in just a short amount of time and realizing all of that, that my body's not my enemy, that I've had this mechanism of disease in my body for decades, that no one's known it, and that I've been basically feeding it trauma and crap in order to make it ever stronger. And just in a few weeks of eating better and eating the things that are suggested by this, and if anyone out there is like, holy shit, this sounds like my life, you can go to medical medium and get some of his books and it'll help you too. I have all my energy back. I have very rare days now where it was almost every day where I had very little energy and had to really, really like, you know, dose out my time on projects very strictly and get most things I wanted to get done, not done. Mm -hmm. And all of these things, it's almost gone. My mind is much clearer, much clearer. I have been able to do things all day, every day for weeks in a row now, which is like blowing my mind. And back to basically where I was before I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's and had this slow decline. And I'm just so grateful for that. And I just hope that more and more people understand at least that concept that your body is constantly trying its best to help you, that you live in an environment of straight shit and that it is eating away at you all the time. And that if you're not giving your body what it needs, it can't help you. And it wants desperately to do so. That's what it was made for. It's actually your best friend. It just desperately wants to help you be healthy and happy. Uh, but you have to work with it and be its partner. And I think believing that it hates you and is attacking you is not helping. You know, the way we understand um, the placebo effect even, or if you want to get spiritual about it, the spirit, the soul. If we're telling our soul constantly that our body hates us and is attacking us, then it's going to be like, okay, I guess... I guess we'll support that message then. You know, I guess we'll keep that energy going for some reason. So to do the opposite is just like a soul level of nutrition to complement the physical nutrition that you can give yourself to uplift your body to. I'm just so grateful to have come across that and to have had that really bad flare up so that I complained about it publicly so that someone sent me the screenshot so that I figured it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's really really awesome to hear, and and yeah, I guess similar similar yeah similar results here, and and deep, I guess, but I guess from a traditional Chinese medicine perspective, uh, weak constitution, it was feeding into other organ systems. So it was, I had I had all sorts of things uh, growing up. I was constantly sick with something. It seemed like, um, well, that's why it's because it was just feeding into other organ systems. But um, I've I over well, the over the past few years, I've been I've been reversing. Um, I've been like tracking. I, I've got they have a picture in the book in the in the textbook I bought um, for traditional Chinese medicine, and like I've been I tracked back um, like I'm tracking back the symptoms. So if I've gone back, uh, so if I've gone back this far, then why can't I go another step or two? Um, yeah, this I I, I yeah I, I yeah definitely definitely um, um, I think I, I remember who I heard say it, but if there's blood flowing to it, then there's always hope. Like it's not a decay. It's the organ yeah. is not decaying in your body. So if there's blood, if there's blood flowing to it, then there's, yeah, you can, you can, yeah. you can take care of it. Yeah. I like that. That's a really good concept to think about. And I, my traditional Chinese medicine, <laughs> my acupuncturist basically would always be like, there's something with your liver. Like what's, what's going on with your liver? You might need to go to like an actual doctor and get your, and my liver always checked out fine with the actual doctor. And so I was always like, I don't know, just every Chinese practitioner tells me that. And I guess I just have something weird with my liver. And I, in my head, I'm like, well, I did a lot of drugs, so I guess it could be that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but now I know that's because that's where this Epstein-Barr virus, if that's what we want to call it, this entity, that's where it first takes up residence. It comes, it affects you. You get scarlet fever, or, uh, glandular fever, or mono or whatever. And then it goes into your liver and it hides there. And that's its main base of reproduction. So of course they were always noticing that there was something in my liver that they couldn't pinpoint, couldn't understand. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I'm glad you're, so I'm glad you're wisdom, feeling better. Baby. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's always always great to see people. Uh, um, it's always yeah, especially with uh, um, you know uh, so-called chronic illness. Um, that uh, you know it's, right. it's it is it's yeah, it's possible to to to, to reverse anything. Um, I I'm, yeah, because yeah. diabetes is another one. Yeah, that and they say can't be, but yeah, lots and, of people and, have done it. And it's funny. I mentioned Phoenix Aurelius earlier. Um, he was I. This was like I was kind of skeptical, but I was like opening my mind to some of these things. And I was like, you know, I guess I'll send Phoenix Aurelius an email just to see if he knows anything. Well, he works with a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, and he was like, uh, she's the only person I've ever seen successfully reverse it um, for long term. So, um, like, I got mm -hmm. the best. Um, pointers from a spagyra system medical astrologer so like um after that i was like 
all right f it like i'm going in like i'm, I'm like it's it's that's 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 so yeah it's it's been it's been interesting well, and it's funny because the naysayers and the people who are just like death grasp on the traditional Western system will look at you like you're insane. And they'll be like worried about you. Like, why are you doing this? And you're like, why am I feeling better? I mean, don't you want yeah. me to feel better? But so many people are, I think they're genuinely scared that if that's true, then what else could be true? Yeah. And it's the same with yeah. all of this garbage that we've ex been experiencing over the last year and a half or whatever is this mm -hmm. desperate grasp onto the lie that people are told because if they are even a glimpse seeing past the veil or through this illusion, then they have to start questioning everything else too. And they just yeah. don't want to. It would cause way too much chaos in their mind <laughs> and maybe in their entire lives. And so they desperately fight against anyone who has a bit of truth and they um push away anything that could give them that truth yeah sad yeah it uh it, it definitely is it definitely is um but uh, i mean i can certainly understand it's not uh <clears throat> last year was it was it was incredible because it was like I, I learned so much and i i i guess i was exposed to so many new things but uh it was super overwhelming too and i've been like an anarchist focusing on solutions since like 2015 so like it's like i was not new to a lot of stuff but like um, but still like that last year was, um, I, the way that I put it is I think I had like three, three or five years of growth or t maybe a 10 years of growth in like a year in like a, you know, 16 months or whatever. But I think a lot of the people had yeah. similar, similar experiences. Um, so yeah, I don't think that's, that's, yeah. To me. Well, no, but it's so beautiful to hear about because then it starts to help you understand what's actually happening right now. And what's actually happening right now is a spiritual war and it's not, doesn't have to be like the good versus evil and the angels and the demons, although it kind of is, but it's like, no, like on the spiritual level, it's an, it's a level of awareness that you either have or don't have. And, um, you know, the, the level of degradation and illusion and control that's being cast out to try to draw in all of these people and souls and their energy, uh, is just, just as they're gathering in a lot of these people into the illusion, they're causing, I think more, at least equal, if not more people to see the net being cast and go, whoa, whoa, like what's this game actually about? And it's waking them up way more than they ever would have been. Cause like you said, like maybe they saw through the economic game, maybe they saw through the educational game, maybe they saw through some of the government game, but they didn't see the spiritual. They didn't see the emotional and the mental, and now they do. And that's more powerful than, <laughs> it's like Obi-Wan, right? You can try to strike me down, but I will become more powerful than you could ever imagine. And it's exactly like that. Like I think their hubris, is actually causing the exact thing that will win out against them in the end. Yeah. And that's awareness. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and yeah, to, to kind of conclude on a positive note, I, 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 for the longest time, I really didn't have like in public um, interactions with people that I, that were like noteworthy or anything. But over the course of the past, you know, three weeks or so, I have, I've had three conversations, one with a, with a, a guy, just a guy in Aldi. I, I was, I was at Aldi and he walked up and started talking to me and we talked for like half an hour and he was into Kabbalah and like, just, he just had the feeling that he should come <laughs> and talk to me. Um, and, uh, I was, awesome. uh, at, went to a local spring and yeah, granted where I'm at, where I'm at out here, it's very much leave me alone type people. But, um, I guess over the past uh, year or so, um, they're just the, the the guy at the spring was like, you know, I've been a libertarian for my whole life, but now I'm kind of an anarchist. Like this is like we don't need them. Like we can take care of ourselves. And I was like, yeah, man. And we didn't we didn't bring yeah. it bring it up or anything. Um, but I've had more interactions like that. So like yeah, I think you're right that um, I I don't think like the first realm can be saved per se. Um, but I do think a lot of people mm -hmm. are um, yeah are a, a lot of people are becoming more aware of. Uh, of just uh, the the scope of things, and uh, yeah, it's 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 good to yeah. see. It's good to see, and we can we can uh, um, you know well well the uh, well that's happening in the first realm. We can uh, we can build the second realm and give people options, um, options for for uh, for better lives and things. So um, I guess uh, I'll just uh, yeah. In, in, in summation, I'll turn it over to you. Do you have any any other closing thoughts before I let you go? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I, you know, bringing it back to something you said early in the show is, you know, just being with your breath uh, and breathing correctly, if you want to call it that, or at least more deeply and with more awareness and consciousness uh, can be its own way of bringing that energy into that public space. So you don't have to be like the weirdo who's like, hey, who in here likes anarchy and spiritual stuff? But like, but you just breathing in that way, holding that presence, like try it, right? Go, I was today in the gym and I was uh, breathing, you know, deeply. And I was holding my awareness inside of myself and I was sending out a message for anyone who wanted to hear it. 
I love you. I love you. I love you. And I'm not inviting any weirdos to come like feed off me, but I'm sending it out as an energy, an energetic signature that is basically true of all humans that nature, God, or whatever you want to call it, loves them deeply. Uh, and I noticed more than ever before, people were just like staring at me. <laughs> And I was like, I don't have like, you know, blood on my face or like ripped up clothes or whatever, but they're just like looking at me. And then they notice me like smile at them and they'd like look away, but then they'd like look back. And I don't think they even necessarily understood why, but that energy that you can hold, and especially if you're offering it in that sort of spirit of like, you don't get to feed off me, but you do get to remember that you are loved and that you are connected to this source too something they desperately need and they react to it. Uh, and that could spark some conversations. And I had more conversations in the gym today than I generally do while doing that. So it was my own little social experiment. And I invite anyone listening to try something like that mm -hmm. to bring some awareness to people, or at least that message that they may not have heard or felt in a really long time. Uh, and then I would love to invite people to Rogue Ways or Middle Path on Rockfin or on YouTube or on any podcast app. And then on my site, if people want to connect further, there's a place to contact me. And there's also all of my services that I offer spiritually and tarot readings and orgone and blessed jewelry and all kinds of stuff. And my books, if they would like to buy them directly from me instead of Amazon. Very good. Very good. Well, um, I, uh, yeah, Lindsay, I definitely appreciate you coming on. That was a great conversation and, uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can get, uh, your books on the LUA site and, uh, push them out, uh, push them out to our audience too and uh get uh, get get those uh, into the hands of yeah. more folks um but uh but yeah we'll, we'll definitely awesome. uh, we'll definitely be in touch it was a uh, yeah, great conversation and um uh, i'll put uh, links to all your stuff uh, in the show notes uh, but anything else before i let you go i think that's good thank you so much okay. for having me all right awesome well uh thanks Lindsay. Uh, until until next time all right, guys, and uh, there you have it, uh, Lindsay Sharman from uh, Rogue Ways. I definitely recommend you go check out her podcast. Um, lots of uh, lots of valuable stuff, and uh, I'll, I'll drop the links to the episodes I mentioned above. Um, go listen to the one on uh, on Oregon. That was uh, with uh, Mitch, the Oregon donor. Uh, it was a really really great conversation, and uh, um, yeah, start just start playing around with these things. Um, it's uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not, I mean, you're not only, uh, you know, helping things, but, uh, you're also, uh, you know, it's also just really, really fascinating. All of these, uh, these various avenues, whether it's pagerics or, um, you know, kind of, uh, the electrical healing sort of stuff or, or just alternative, whatever it's all, uh, um, the, the world is a lot more interesting and, uh, um, and, uh, yeah, um, the uh, the bookends of reality are a lot a lot uh, wider than what we've been uh, led to believe. So, um, with that, thanks for uh, tuning into the Vani podcast. Uh, until next time, see you guys. Vanu means relative physical and vulnerability to coercion. Vanu is a contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. Vanu is somewhat like freedom or security, but those words mean many different things to different people. Rather than argue about what those words ought to mean, I speak of Vanu. Coercion includes murder, mayhem, slavery, robbery, rape, extortion, pollution, any physical interference with peaceful activities of another, whether by individuals or organizations. Coercion, especially institutionalized forms such as war, regimentations, and taxes, is one of the major problems of mankind. Practically all past attempts at solution have been top-down efforts to change society as a whole. Since the days of Babylon, there have been countless attempts to reform governments, take over governments, destroy governments, and manipulate public opinion. At most, such efforts bring temporary relief. Usually they have little effect. Often, they make matters worse. Vanu life represents a different approach to the problem. Vanu life does not waste space scolding government officials or proclaiming how society ought to be. Vanu life speaks to you as an individual or small group and suggests ways you can avoid exploiting and being exploited. As you reduce the vulnerability, not only do you help yourself, Indirectly, you also help others by decreasing support of criminal institutions. Vanu is not necessarily only a few. Vanu will expand as there are more people willing to do. A Vanuan is a person who has achieved relative invulnerability to coercion. There are many kinds. Some live in the wilderness, where outsiders rarely go. Others live under the earth. Others move from place to place, living in vans, campers, buses, boats, or tents. Some have been Vanu for ages, people such as gypsies, mountain men, hobos, seminoles. Others are recent refugees from the dying cities. This issue describes some of the equipment and techniques used. 
In future issues, I hope you'll add your knowledge to what is in here. Vanu life. How to live and let live. Out of sight and minds of those unwilling to let live. By people who are doing it. To order your paperback copy today, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu life. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu life. Or to download this publication for free, visit vanupodcast.com forward slash VL.